Hey guys, we are back here on the Man Advantage podcast, and uh, today is an off day for the Rangers. And joining us today, none other than Stat Boy Steven, who was kind enough to give us a few minutes and just talk everything Rangers. Steven, how are you? Good, good. Always love talking hockey. So, um, you know, if you if you want to catch my attention, if you want to take away some of my time, just invite me to a hockey conversation. There you go. And I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and talking. It's always good to go back and forth on Twitter with you. It's uh, it's always very, very informative. So, hey, uh, let's talk after trade deadline. What do you think of the Rangers play since they've made all these acquisitions? Um, it's hard to argue against the Rangers since the deadline. I mean, they are the number one team in the league in goals against. Like, the, they have the fewest goals allowed since the trade deadline. Um, I actually updated this this afternoon i i keep like this uh this excel sheet where i track the scores of all the players that were traded in the month of march for their new teams right the only player to have more points than andrew cobb is claude Giroux. um yeah. and then matthew joseph so claude Giroux is 17 andrew cobb has 15 matthew joseph 12 and then frank vetrano with 11. Nice. The Rangers have two of the top four producers among players that were traded in the month of March. So, yeah, the trade deadline was a success. Uh, Tyler Mott is a, is, a, is a really good one as well, unfortunately, injured now. Yeah. Uh, but Drury did exactly what I wanted them to do. You know, I, I wanted them to go after players without giving up the the uh, valuable assets. You know, don't give up your first round pick. Don't give up your top prospects. And he gave up a conditional first, which I'm okay with. You know, if the condition is making the conference finals, yeah, if we make the conference finals, I'll gladly part with my first round pick. So, yeah, uh, it was a great deadline, uh, like the polar opposite of the offseason, which was questionable. Uh, and the Rangers have been great. You know, three consecutive shutouts for the first time since 1973. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Kreider, 50 goals. Uh, Panarin, 70 assists, close to 100 points. Fox is probably hitting a point per game at the end of the season. Shashjorkin is a lock for the Vezina. Um, Gallant should win the Jack Adams. Yes. Seeing where we came from and where we are now, that should get a lot of Jack Adams votes. So, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to not get excited about this team. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Last night I was uh, watching the game with my kids and – I always try to tell them um, that I've been reminding them recently that this has been such a special season with all the things that are happening, you know, with Shosturkin and um, Kreider, 50 goals. I said, you know, I in my lifetime, I've only seen two guys. I mean, Vic Hatfield, I was alive, but it was like one. Uh, I remember Adam Graves, and, of course, I remember Yarmir Yager. Mm -hmm. So this is a special um, uh, accomplishment. And it, it, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy and a guy that I think that works hard and, you know, probably yeah. deserved, took a lot of, you know, beat downs from the Ranger fans. But, boy, he has just been unbelievable this year. And, you know, you know what makes it even better? That it's one of our own draft picks who does it. Who I picked. know. It's so funny how over the last couple of years, always talking about Tony Monty, Tony Monty, Tony Monty. And I loved Tony Monty, mm -hmm. but boy, I'm glad I don't have to hear his name anymore. <laughs> yes. So. yes. So I, I remember throughout the season, I was like, oh, who's going to be the first Rangers draft pick to hit 60 points? Because among forwards, Tony Monty in 93 was the last one. And I remember at the start of the season, we were talking about, is it going to be Kako or Lafreniere? Is it going to be Kako or Lafreniere? And some people were like, no, maybe Kravtsov is going to surprise all of us before things went bad. Right. And, and, and Kreider was – I created a poll with four, those four players, including Kreider. And I think like 9% voted for Kreider or something like that. It's, it's such an unbelievable run by him. And anyone who seriously thought he was going to hit 50 points this season is lying. There's yeah. no one in the world, not even Kreider's parents, who expected him to go from 28 to 50. Right. Yeah, when, so, he, got to, when he got to 30 – I was like, you know what? I hope he he still gets like 40 to 45. Like, it, you know, mm -hmm. but I, he's been so consistent and just, you know, 
Yeah. He's just played so well this year. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. It's not like he's doing anything different. I mean, maybe you know he gets lucky a couple times with some deflections mm-hmm. or what have you, but his game really we're, hasn't changed. We're going to have Kreider, Zibanejad, Panarin, Strom, and Fox all hit career high in points in the same season. Yeah. That's that's something else. So, mm-hmm. like I said, you know, I was telling my kids, it it's a special season. And, you know, listen, it's really hard to win the Stanley Cup. We, we know that. And it can still be a successful year, mm-hmm. even if they don't win. I mean, of course. there's lots of things to look at and say, hey, this went right. And there's been a lot more things that have gone right yeah. than have gone wrong. And that's if I if I look back at like the, the 2010s, you know, uh, the 2011 2012 season. Yes. Yeah, we lost in the conference finals, but that season has so many highlights for me. You know, you have the Winter Classic. Yep. Sweeping the sweeping the Flyers, uh, the Richards goal in Arizona with 0.1 seconds to go. Yeah. The Kreider goals in the playoffs. Um, I think that that was the year that Callahan had a hat trick in Philly, where the Rangers played in white in their white jerseys. I think that was the same year. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. You know, you had the um, you had the playoffs itself, where you had that equalizer with six point six seconds to go by Richards, and then Stahl winning it in overtime. What so many great moments at just one season, you know. And then 20, 2012, uh, 2013, the shortened season. Yeah. Uh, also, great memories. You know, you have Stepan getting forty four points in forty eight games. You you beat the Capitals in the first round, which had been a thorn in our in our in our. In our, in, our, in our side for years. So beating them back to back in the playoffs, you know, 2011 and, or 2012 and then 2013. Yeah, you lose to the Bruins, but still so many amazing moments. And then the following year, you make it all the way to the cup final yep. with the stadium series games against the Devils and the Islanders. And then the year after, you win the President's Trophy where Lundqvist goes down and Talbot comes in and Nash scores 42 goals. And yeah, we we can talk all about wanting to win the cup, but to me, seasons are about so much more than that. And if we don't win a cup, it's not a lost season for me. Yeah. In fact, I would love for the Rangers to win the division, mostly because it would add a banner to the rafters at Madison Square Garden. I know most fans don't care about division championship banners, but let's be realistic here. The Rangers don't have that many, yeah. <laughs> so it's not something to brag about. And if we don't win a cup, it would be nice to have a banner in the rafters for eternity to remind us of this amazing season. Yes. And, you, you know, know, good. Yeah. Something in the rafters, even if it is just a division banner, division yeah. championship banner, you know, something that reminds people of, oh, yeah, I remember that season. Like the 71 72 season, you know, where, where uh, Rattel, Gilbert, and Hatfield were on pace to all hit 100 points on the same line in the same season. Those are seasons that should be remembered even if we did not win a cup. The 91-92 season, pre- President's Trophy winning season, that season should be remembered even if we did not win a cup. You know, we lost to, was that the year we lost to the Penguins? Yes. So yeah. It, yeah. it's so funny that you bring that up because today on YouTube, I was just, you know, looking through my YouTube and I got this recommendation and it was, Pretty much a full game. It was the Rangers versus the Capitals from December 26, 1991, where the Rangers were down six to one in the first. Actually, John O'Grodnick actually scored a goal with 0.2 seconds left in the first to make it six two. And the Rangers came back and scored the next six goals and won the game eight to six on the road. And it's so funny. I remember watching that game at a, we had a we were off to school and. I was 19 at the time, and I remember playing pool and watching the game, and me and all my friends were, were just like, ugh, caps. And then they came back and won. It was one of those games that, holy moly, it was just – it was crazy. It was one of those crazy, crazy games. But like you said, 71-72, um, I was born in 1972. So, of course, I don't remember that. But my brothers and my dad used to always talk about that season – and how great the the Rangers were that year, and they really felt like they could have had a chance against uh, Boston if it, if it came to Boston and the Rangers. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't recall the playoff matchup, but Rattel getting hurt was was something that they couldn't recover from. So yeah, yeah. yeah. If and and Rattel was, if not their best player, a top three player on the team. So 
losing a top three player, yeah. no team is recovering from that. Yeah. Take any team in the league right now. If the Florida Panthers are losing Barkov or Huberdo, they're done. Yeah. By the way, I don't know if you saw it. Did you see his third goal last night? The overtime winner? Uh, no, no. I haven't I haven't gone over well, it's, that. It, when you get a chance, but I won't harp on it, but he's just a, such a great player. Huberdo made the pass. But the, the, the fact that Barkov, and you'll understand this when you see the play, Barkov waited. That's all I'm going to say is he just waited and he put the puck in the net. But you, you just have to see the play to understand why I'm saying he waited the perfect amount of time. But let's get back to the Rangers. Um, all right, so who do you want to play in the first round? Who do you think we're going to play and who would you like to play? Don't care. I just want to win the division. Yeah, I, I I really don't care about who we play in the playoffs. I know some fans want to play the Penguins because we've done well against them in the regular season. But in 2019, 2020, we swept the Carolina Hurricanes for nothing in the regular season, only to then be swept by them in the qualifying round. So regular season performance is, is no indicator at all for success against the same opponent. Uh, I just want to win the division. We're tied in points with Carolina. We play them next week. We yep. basically own our own destiny. You know, win the division and get home ice advantage for not the first, but also the second round. Correct. And especially in the playoffs, you know, I, I I think people don't don't really care too much about home ice advantage, but I rather play the Carolina Hurricanes in four home games than in four games on the road in the second round. Okay, so. It, it, I agree with you. I don't care who we play. Uh, you know, I feel like in any series we go into, except for Tampa Bay, we have the advantage in goal, a big advantage uh -huh. in, in goaltending. Um, you know, and, and you brought up a stat a little bit earlier about um, the Rangers goals, goals against since the deadline. And just before we came on, I actually saw something that was tweeted out by um, – uh, Steve Alcat, and he said the Rangers also are, are, are averaging 24.3 shots against since the deadline. So, yeah, those are all good numbers, and you know that's kind of the, the way things are trending. And mm -hmm. I think when you go into a, a series, you you want to uh, be playing solid defensively. You know, again, last night's game, I, I talked about it on my show, and they played a little loosey goosey. It's, it's uh, it was a, it was a snooze fest. I know we won three nothing with a shutout, but man, it was hard to. Uh, it, it, for me, it was a late game because you know here they only start at midnight. It was for the first time in months where I struggled to just stay awake because the game just wasn't that entertaining. Yes, I agree. With you. The, the first period was I, I blinked twice and it was over. <laughs> um, yeah. No, but. But the fact that the Rangers have improved defensively despite adding three forwards, because, yeah, we added Justin Brown, but he played, like, what, two or three games? Sure. Um, the main additions are Cobb, Vetrano, and Mott. And yet our defense is better, which goes to show you that defense is a team game. It's, it's all five players on the ice have to play defense. And my biggest gripe with this team prior to the deadline, and you know this because we've been over this a couple of times, my biggest issue was always that five on five, we were not good enough. Right. We were relying on elite goaltending and a power play that was that was out of this world. Um, and then at the deadline, you add a couple of players, and all of a sudden, five on five, we're one of the better teams. I think I think two or three weeks after the deadline, the Rangers were first in the league in even strength goals, and. This is the main reason why I, I wasn't I wasn't really thrilled to uh, to read rumors about Hurdle and Giroux and I've been very vocal about the Rangers. Not want, I I didn't want them to be buyers like go all in. I wanted them to make like like calculated moves. You know, get a player for a third round pick, get a player for a fourth round pick, and that's exactly what Rory did. The biggest deal he made was cop for two seconds and Morgan Barron. Which is basically the the same deal we we gave up for Eric Stahl in what was it 2016? Yes, that was the 2016 deadline. Yeah, it was two second round picks and Alexi Sarala, who we got in the third round. This was two second round picks and Morgan Barron, yep. with a condition that it's a first round if we make it to the final four. Um, 
and it, it works. You know, you, you make some minor tweaks, some minor adjustments, and you're not giving up your first round picks. You're not giving up Nils Lundqvist, Braden Schneider, Zach Jones. You're not giving up Brennan Othman, Brett Berard, Ryder Korzak. The best, the only player you gave up is Morgan Barron, who didn't really have a future in New York anyway because he was stuck behind Greg McKegg. <laughs> um, so uh, nothing against Barron. I think he's going to be a really solid third liner in Winnipeg. But on the Rangers, it just wasn't going to work out. So I don't really feel bad about losing him. And, and Cop is probably the reason why Strom is not a Ranger next season. I Okay, so two things I agree with you right there. First off about Barron. I liked him. I wish the Rangers kind of gave him a little bit more of a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, me too. But if that shot never comes, then can we really be upset about trading him away? No, no. And um, I, I just I had high hopes. I like his size and physicality, and I think he's going to be a smart player. But yeah. you know, so you got to give to get. Um, and then the whole Strom thing. Um, you know, if you were a fly on my wall in my house, I there's several times that I just kind of throw my hands up in the air and just say negative things about Ryan Strom, who, you know, of course I don't know him. And, um, but as a hockey player, I feel like this last half of the year, and we've talked about this, you know, with the contract being up in the air, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure on him and you don't know that could be affecting him. And yeah, I'm glad he had two goals last night, but um, if you said, let's give similar contracts to Strom or cop, I actually think you could get cop a little bit, cheaper but i'd rather have cop because i feel like he can do more and is maybe more of a postseason player with his size I, like i like i compare him to like a jt miller light um he's not as skilled as jt miller but mm-hmm. he's not going to cost nine million dollars next year either so yeah and and this is a conversation that sometimes comes up with like people oh talk about chris Kreider, you know go uh why didn't he score 50 goals in previous seasons and i always go well if he did we wouldn't have signed him for 6.5 million so people go oh i wish Kreider was more consistent yeah but he would cost 12 million if he's if he plays consistently the way he plays some games he'd be he'd be making as much as artemi panera and Conor mcdavid this is why players make six and a half million because they're not consistent he's having a career year and and i couldn't be happier and I'm so glad it happens after we sign him. That's right. He's out um, doing his contract right now. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's great. But Cop, uh, I think Cop fills a bigger hole for the Rangers uh, as a player. You know, he plays all situations. You can use him on the power play. He plays the penalty kill. At even strength, he really meshes well with Artemi Panarin. And the main reason I expected Strong to be a Ranger next season is because we did not have a replacement. Now we have one. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a hurdle that every, everybody wanted. It's Andrew Kopp. So, yeah, um, I I don't think Strom is going to be a Ranger next season. Uh, I hope he signs a great contract. I hope he he negotiates his ass off and earns like seven and a half million a year for the next seven years with a team that has the cap space. Um, a team like Seattle or Arizona. I was thinking uh, the exact same thing, Seattle or Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Seattle has Yanni Gord. They have Matt Beneers, who was coming up, who was the second overall pick yeah. last summer. Adding Ryan Strom to that, I mean, it's not the worst idea in the world. They, they, Like I said, they have the cap space, getting a veteran presence in the locker room. You know, team teams appreciate that, and players do too. So Yeah, Strom is definitely like a, you know, a pro's pro. I mean, he's been around the block. Mm-hmm. I and mean, he's not old, but he's not young. Um and like I said, that was a steal of a trade by Gordon. I mean, Spooner mm-hmm. for uh, Strom is looking like an amazing trade. Um, but you know, at some point, we've kicked that can down the down the block, you know, several times now, and it seems like he's always been rumored to be traded. And you know, if he gets his money, good good on him and for his family. Yeah, and and I will never blame a player for going with a bigger contract because these guys have to earn a life's worth of wages in a decade and even that's generous because most hockey players don't play for a decade um i remember reading somewhere that the average total salary of an nhl player is is like under five million total 
because you have players who are on you know minimum league deals for like if you if you make league minimum you have to play in the league for like eight nine years to even get five million yeah and that's before tax before escrow before agent fees um nutritionist sorry nutritionist yeah nutritionist personal trainer yeah all that know. Uh, they don't live. They don't live in a shitty apartment either. So you know, they either buy okay. an expensive place or they or they rent extremely expensive places. Yeah, there's not a lot of money left at the at the at the end of their careers in in most cases. So if a guy can go out there and earn millions, yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit. Um, so I've been talking to my kids about uh, a couple of players that have been really impressive to me, it, as of not as of late, but as the season's gone on players that have impressed me. Uh, and I would say the top one on my list is, is Keandre Miller. Oh yes. Yes. I, Miller, I, the last couple of weeks has been amazing. He, I would say he's our best defensive defenseman because Fox is not having a great couple of weeks, but Miller has really stepped up his game. I, uh, I agree with you. And I see so much untapped potential with him. He's a physical freak. I mean, he's 6'5", 215, 220 pounds. He can skate like the wind. And I really think he's starting to understand um, his job. And I, and I know that might sound like so simple, mm -hmm. but his job with Jacob Truba. But I also feel like he's really scratching the surface offensively. And he's really – he's kind of feeling it offensively. And I just feel like the sky's the limit with this kid. Yeah. Yeah. Like my, my biggest issue with Miller or especially early in the season was mostly the defensive side of his game. Offensively, you know, it, the highlights were always there, you know, that four and four goal against the Florida Panthers. I think yeah. um, that, that highlight reel type goal or skating the puck out of the zone and, and, and setting up a scoring chance. I know he can do that. You know, I've seen that many times. I wanted him to be better defensively, better in his own zone. And the last couple of weeks, I don't know what he's been eating, but man, he's been, <laughs> he's been great. I mean, his his poke checks connect with the puck like nine out of ten times. Yeah. Um, he he doesn't shy away from using the body, you know. And and this is something that he didn't really like early on in his career, but again, it's something you grow into. Uh, like the kids, what like twenty two? Just turned twenty two. Uh, just turned 22 in January, um, and the, the 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 ceiling was always sky high. I mean, the talent was always there. The question mark was always, will he reach his potential? And the way he's been progressing the last couple of weeks, yeah, it's really looking good. And the Rangers really need this because that right side on defense is pretty much set. You have Fox, Truba, Schneider. You have Lundqvist still in in the uh, in Hartford who can step up if and when they move Truba. But the left side has been a little bit of a question mark. You know, Lindgren is okay when he plays with Fox, but if Fox is not on his game, Lindgren is not able to carry that top pair for the Rangers. Um, then you have Zach Jones, who wasn't really trusted by Gallant because, you know, he's, he's not, he doesn't have like a physical presence and he's more offensive minded. And, and then the, the Patrick Nemeth, I mean, nothing against Nemeth, but, when you have, uh, you know, when you have guys like Robertson and Jones waiting in the wings, it's really difficult to not get excited about those two. So we'll see what happens in the coming years. But Miller stepping up, yeah, I'm very happy to see that. And honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing a Miller Fox pairing for a couple of games just to see what they can bring before we go into the playoffs. I, I would like that too. Um, it's funny you bring up Nemeth. You know, he's had a lot of issues off the ice mm -hmm. this year. I know with the COVID and, uh, you know, and that, that he had some health issues there and some personal issues as well. I, I feel like, you know what, it, he's definitely gotten better these last, this maybe the last month. Yeah. Um, it's not nearly as bad as it was early on in the season. So, you know, kudos to him for stepping up and, you know, he's, he's trying his best. And um, I think, it's way better than having Libor Hayek in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've seen Libor Hayek and 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 Jared Tenorti play for the Rangers this season. Oh my God, Tenorti! 
Um, yeah, sorry, sorry to uh, <laughs> sorry to mention that name, but oh, man, I was at the game uh, in November when they played the Buffalo Sabers hockey fights. Oh, I remember that game. Oh, man, I I think Tenorti and Nemeth had three assists each, but all on Buffalo Sabers goals. It was <laughs> yeah. it was so bad. It was so bad. But um, now Nemeth had a really bad start to the season, and it lasted until like January. Uh, the last, I would say, six to eight weeks, he's been he's been serviceable. And yeah. from a third pair defenseman, that's all you want. You want them to not be a liability. Sure. As long as he can keep this up, I have no problem with him being in the lineup. It's more about the cap crunch that the Rangers are going to be in next season. Yep. Can you really afford to pay? To pay 2.5 million for a third pair defenseman when you have someone like Zach Jones or Matthew Robertson in Hartford for what 900k um, ultimately you're going to have to make sacrifices not because the players aren't good enough but because you know there's just not, not enough money to go around back in 2015 the Rangers traded Hagelin not because they wanted to but because they had to yeah, there just was right. no no cap space to sign Hagelin, and um, and these trades happen. This is the reason we got Fatrano for a fourth round pick. Yeah. So uh, yeah, next season is going to be interesting because we have, of course, the Banerjee and Fox with our new deals. Um, so that combines for I think eighteen point five million. Yep. Uh, you still have Panarin for eleven point six. Then you have Truba for eight. Uh, Shashurkin for five and a half, Kreider for six and a half. Uh, the money dries up quick when you have yeah. those big contracts on your team. And I'm looking forward to 2023 24 because that will be the first time since 2017 we don't have any cap penalties on the books. It's like an extra like four million, 3.4 million next season yeah. in cap penalties. Yeah, that's basically Frank for Toronto. Yeah, all right. Let, geez. Um, well, so anyway, and the one good thing is with Nemeth playing, it lets um, Robertson and Zach Jones and even Lundquist play in, mm-hmm. in in Hartford. So they're they're you know they're playing. It's not like they're sitting in the in the uh, press box watching games. But yeah, um, getting back to uh, so we talked about um, Keandre Miller. I really like Braden Schneider too. I think he's I think Fox. Miller and Schneider are the three guys that are going to be here a long time on the defense. Yeah, um, and Schneider, I know a lot of Ranger fans weren't happy when when we drafted him, and it has nothing to do with Schneider, but more that we as a fan base wanted to draft a center because the biggest hole in our prospect pool has been for years the center position. But, man, uh, the Gordon proved us all wrong. I mean – the, the kid's just the kid's dynamite you know he he comes in at age 19 uh or age 20 uh sticks around um and honestly i didn't expect it because defensemen usually take longer when they're drafted outside the top 10 uh but he doesn't look out of place at all um and i was actually had a a, a video call with metarempa yesterday uh oh, Rangers nice. sixth round pick in 2020 uh, and we chatted a little bit about Braden schneider as well uh, and we talked about the the hit on Boquist against the Devils, where Sharon Govich was dropping the gloves, and Ramper is like, "Yeah, in the WHL, you cannot really do that because it's an automatic suspension because they try to protect the junior players. That's so once you get to the NHL, you know all bets are off. And and Schneider is a guy that won't instigate fights, but if you challenge him, he's going to accept the challenge. And yeah, when people call him like like little Truba or or baby Truba, baby Truba, Truba Junior, um, I I get what they're, what they're saying, and and Truba himself knows it. Um, during one of the press conferences, during one of the post game press conferences, he said it that Schneider's coming for my job. So um, yeah, this kid's gonna go places. Uh, and you know, I was I was talking to someone a couple of days ago about this. Uh, I think it was my brother in law. It's nice to finally build your own blue line instead of always signing free agents. Yeah. The Nashville Predators and the Carolina Hurricanes are two teams that have had consistently good defense for like the last decade. They may not have won any cups, but their defense was never the issue. 
you know, in, in Nashville, you had Yossi, Eckholm, Weber, uh, Seth Jones, yeah. Um, now Dante Fabro, uh, Ryan Ellis, Kevin Klein. In in Carolina, you had Justin Falk, uh, uh, Brett Pesci, Jacob Slavin, uh, and on and on it goes. Yeah. And now we're finally seeing that in New York as well. You know, you, you draft Miller, you draft Schneider, you draft Lundquist, Jones, Robertson. Mm-hmm. Of course, you trade for Truba, you trade for Lindgren and Fox, but you could say Lindgren and Fox are sort of like 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 honorary homegrown defensemen because they made their NHL debut for us. Yeah. Um, but having having players come through your own system where all it cost was a draft pick, that's huge. Jones was a third round pick. I know. A he's third the, round he's like pick. A, he's like a first round talent at this point. Yes, yes, he is. Um, and this is what the Rangers need. And we talked earlier about how great this Ranger season is. That's not even with Kako and Lafreniere breaking up. Can you imagine when those guys actually hit hit their strides? Well, uh, you, you you bring up Kako, and I uh, when the Rangers uh, won the lottery, and I agree with you, we won the lottery in 2019. Yeah, so quick, quick, before you continue, because uh, I know what you're referring to. People say we didn't win the lottery because we didn't get the first overall pick, right? Correct. If you buy a lottery ticket and the jackpot is $25 million, but you only win $5 million, are you a winner or not? Hell Did yeah, you? I'm a winner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's basically what the Rangers had. They, they didn't win Jack Hughes, but they won Capo Caco. Exactly. You know? so, they won the second overall pick when they when they finished like 10th from the bottom. That's yeah, winning. That was, winning the lottery. I don't know if you remember, but right before everything, like it just started and someone tweeted out a picture. Yeah, the Finnish broadcast actually uh, ran a test screen on their on their public feed. So I was just curious, like how that even got out. Okay, so the way it works is the actual draw is behind closed doors. There's like right. a machine with 16 ball or 14 balls, and there are a thousand and one combinations where I think 11, 12, 13, 14 would be a redraw. So you have a thousand combinations left that are then divided among the teams. So once that draw is done, um, there's people from, I think, uh, Ernest and Young. Yes. Uh, overseeing it. So it's nothing dodgy. It's not like, it's not like a, uh, like, like a, like an envelope that's bent, like the NBA lottery in the eighties, uh, with Patrick Ewing. Or 2005, or they, 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 there's no there's no talk about you know frozen balls like the 1990 FIFA World Cup. No, uh, <laughs> it's like a proper lottery. But that lottery is done in advance, and after that they set up the broadcast. So right. they run some tests, they make sure the graphics load properly, and the finished broadcast that was that was showing it, they ex- they accidentally uh, showed it on their open channel. So someone quickly recorded it, and it showed. It didn't show the Rangers winning first or second or third overall, but it showed the Rangers being skipped in the announcement. So the moment your logo is skipped, yes. it means it means at the time that you're top three. Yep. Um, and so that's how it happened. Like the the draw itself is isn't is isn't live. Right. Right. It wasn't like 2020. No, 2020 was a different case because there were only eight teams. And this was right. like lottery number two. Uh, so they just had eight balls. And that, the only reason they showed that actual lottery on TV is because you don't have to explain anything to the viewer. Right. You know, there's eight balls in there. They have a logo on it. Whichever logo comes up, that's the team that wins. Correct. But if you have to explain to viewers, you get four combinations and – this person in a suit that's sitting at a desk with a big binder in front of him is going to look up the combination and he's going to tell you what team won the lottery. Yeah, people are going to be people are going to be skeptic. You know, there's there's right. no way you can you can put that out on TV and 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 think everyone's going to going to understand. Right. Um, right. So I understand why they why they go with like the whole presentation with the cards, like the flipping of the cards. Yeah, and that's fine. I actually. I have no problem. I just, they always say, oh, it starts at 7.30, but meanwhile, they just chit-chat for, you know. Well, yeah, so, I, I, look, I live in Europe. I grew up in Europe. When football games, like when Champions League games here start at 9, 
they start at nine. You know, there's no there's no anthem at nine oh two. You know, there's no salute at nine oh seven, and then the game starts at nine twelve. No, <laughs> nine o'clock is nine o'clock. Premier League. 2.30 is 2.30. There's no, it, it, it starts when they say it starts. Yeah. My big, one of my biggest gripes with American sports is that, well, it's mostly hockey actually, because the NFL is still pretty con consistent. Yeah. The NFL, you never see, it's very rare. You, you see the national anthem on yeah. TV. Mm -hmm. It's in baseball. Uh, sometimes it's like, it's, it's usually like a one Oh five start. It usually starts yeah. at one Oh five. But yeah, but if, hockey if is, is on, yeah. If an NHL game is on ESPN or in the past, if it was on NBC and it's at 7 p.m., I didn't expect the game to start until 7:25. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I don't get it. Why don't you start the broadcast at 6:30? You know, we we talked about some of the rules we could change. Uh, we'll have to do another podcast on. Yeah, we need to do an episode where we go over those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, <laughs> we 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 could not only speed things up, we can make the game so much better. Yes. Uh, that would be fun. But so I remember watching the world championships in May of 2019 mm -hmm. and everybody's talking about Kako and rightfully so, because he was, I mean, they, they, Finland won that year, correct? Um, yeah. Kako became the first player ever to win the under 18s, under 20s and the world championship in, in a span of 12 months. Yeah. I, I just remember saying, holy crap, this guy is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh and i know they're playing on different ice servers and, and all that um and he that was still bit... playing against he was still playing as nhl defenseman like that highlight real goal against canada the two defensemen that were on the ice were darnell nurse and brandon montour yeah i'm just i feel like i haven't seen that player since he's come to the rangers no oh well sh there are glimpses of it yeah and i'm like is it confidence is it i just don't understand See, I, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, I, look, this is not bashing the Rangers or anything, but I don't think the problem here is the player when I've seen it happen so many times. Yeah, I know, I know, I know what you're getting at here. And, and I always get the feeling with the Rangers that they are trying to, they're trying to force them to play a different game. Right. Whereas when I look at other teams, when I look at Seth Jarvis in Carolina, Anton mm -hmm. Lindell in Florida, Trevor Zegers in Anaheim, uh, uh, Moritz Seider and Lucas Raymond in Detroit, yeah. when I look at those players, it feels like they're they they they're just so free. They don't have they don't have a care in the world. They're just playing their game. And then yeah. I look at our players, and I get the feeling that that they're they're being sent out on the ice with like fifty five assignments. And, and, you know, I don't know if it's true, but that's just the way it feels. Yeah. Well, I, I'm hoping that, you know, Kako isn't hurt too bad again. Um, mm -hmm. I believe, and I, I know um, Gallant isn't always 100% truthful. Uh, well, last this is not a Gallant thing. I mean, last season, Shishjorkin was day-to-day -day for like a month. <laughs> so. I remember <laughs> that, Yeah. <laughs> It's so um, funny how in that, with hockey, it's like you got a lower body injury, and uh, we'll know more tomorrow. And you yeah. know, then you know, a week goes by, it's like you got a lower body injury, we'll know more yeah. tomorrow. So, which part of the body did he injure? Well, best I could do is 50 50. It's either upper body or lower body. Yeah, you get a right. hangnail, you get a lower body injury, or I guess it could be upper body if it's on your hand. But, um, yeah. uh, I, I just and I was happy that you know, the kid scored two goals against Philly and. You know, I feel like this year when he when he was playing with Strom and Panarin, he looked mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, and then Blay went out with injury, and Gallant shuffled not one but two lines, which yeah I always thought was a mistake. If you want to replace Blay on that Zibanejad line, then just put someone else in there. Yeah, don't move up Kako and then move someone else up to the Panarin line, and then create two new lines. You know, stick with what works. Yeah. Um, and then we had Dryden Hunt with Panarin and Strom for six months. And yeah, how many? He scored like six goals. He scored four goals in November, and then he scored another two in March. And and it just it, it sucks that you know. We, and I didn't want to mention his name, but we traded away Butchnevich. Yeah, Kravtsov then bolted. You know, he he left. Then Blay goes out with injury. 
uh, Lafreniere is on the third line, and all of a sudden you have you have Dryden Hunt in your top six, and I don't know. It just the reason the Rangers scored on the power play is because on the power play, our best players play together. Yeah, you know, actually, I like Dryden Hunt, and I think he tries hard, and mm -hmm. but he's not a top six player. No, uh, but neither, neither was neither was Colin Blackwell. No, no. And you know oh, when yes, he owes oh, yes, his, no, <laughs> another guy I really. But I love uh, Jesper Faust. No, I love Jesper. I love Jesper Faust. Don't get me wrong, but it's like they're trying to do the same thing over and over again with different players. Faust. Yes, and I, I, no, huh? I agree. But you know, real quick, Dryden Hunt owes all all the credit to all the goals he scores when you are in America. So uh, yes, all his goals were scored when I'm in the U.S. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was in New I was in New York for for three weeks in November December, and then I was in I was in Minnesota St Louis and New York for about a three week span in March, and in the, those six weeks combined he scored all his goals. He didn't score a single goal in between. Uh, yeah, I should probably get a Dryden Hunt jersey. You should. I mean, come on, man. I mean, or he, you yeah. know what? He should send you one. He should probably send me one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and six pucks. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what though, it, it it just really stinks. Um, so I think he's okay on the fourth line. I mean, like you know, he goes out mm -hmm. there, he's got lots of energy. He 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 skates well. You know, um, if I'm the Rangers, so they have a small problem. You know, let's 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 talk about the playoffs. Let's say they run out Kreider, Zibanejad, and Vetrano. We can probably agree on that. Mm -hmm. Then you're looking at um, Strom, Panarin, and Cop. Yes. As, Second line. Third line. All right. This is where it gets interesting. If Kako is not healthy, it's pretty easy. It's Heedle, Goudreau, Lafreniere. Yep. And then your fourth line would be Rooney, Hunt. And Reeves. And Reeves. And honestly. Unless Tyler Mott is back, of course. Yeah, and they're saying it's don't expect him back. Um, no. Which, which sucks think? because – I love I love what Tyler Mott brings to the team. Yeah, I yeah. love the way he plays the penalty kill because he plays the penalty kill like no one else. He plays the penalty kill based on possession. Yeah, when he gets the puck, he doesn't just dump it in. He yeah. looks around, and if he sees an opportunity to pass it back to the defense, he does. And it's such a simple play, but it kills off another 10, 15, maybe twenty seconds off your penalty kill. That's huge. Sure. And it tires out the other team because it. Trust me, when you're when you're on the power play, I know this from from experience because when I play men's league, I get really frustrated when the other team gets the puck, and then I gotta go chase after them, and I'm like, oh, just give. And they're just passing play. it back and forth, and you feel yeah. like you're. Yeah. I'm too, old, I'm too old for this, uh, Stephen. I'm like, come on, just give us the puck so we can go in the zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. But yeah, but if Kako is available to play. What do you do on the fourth line? Okay, so, well, first of all, if Kako is, is available, I don't really feel comfortable having Kako, Lafreniere, and Hilo on the same line because they're it's just too young. Agreed. I would probably move Lafreniere to the Zibanejad line and then put Vetrano with Hilo and Kako and have Goudreau on the fourth line with then Rooney and, and either Reeves or Brodzinski or Hunt depending on what you're what you're expecting what what you, what you want out of your fourth line that game. Okay. I I like what you said there. I like that you have the one good thing is you have options. Um yeah, and and this was a great thing that happened at the deadline because for most of the season we had guys like Brodzinski, McKeg, Gautier oh. uh, all yeah. playing. And yeah. having one of those players in your lineup is fine, but when Half of your bottom six is basically AHL players with all due respect. And you're not going to go far. But now yeah. those players are healthy scratches. You know, we have 12 NHL forwards. What We do. What do you think about this? And I was kind of thinking about this uh, last night. Mm -hmm. Keep the first lines the same. Okay. And then cop to the third. I was going to add cop to the third and mm -hmm. hear me out here because that moves Goudreau down to the fourth. And then you have Heedle, 
Cop, Lafreniere, and then you have Taco, Panarin, and Strom. Mm -hmm. um, I actually like your idea of Lafreniere and switching up Lafreniere and Vetrano, though. That's something I would probably play around with. Um, but the, the, like I said, the, the nice thing is that you do have options. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put Paco or Lafreniere on that fourth line. That's something I don't want to see. No. So I, I think I don't want, I don't want to up to pick on the fourth line ever. No. Yeah, ex exactly. All right. So we're, we're kind of in agreement there that they should move. And I got to tell you, man, Goudreau has been a, and I know everybody complains about the salary. And the dude's got like 31 or 32 points. The way he's played this season, his his contract is is not a problem at all. Yeah. I mean With what he brings, yeah, easy. Easy money. Easy, not, easy decision. And he brings way more than his points. Mm -hmm. Way if you, would have, if you would have told me at the start of the season he's gonna have between 30 and 35 points, I'd be like, all right, 3.6 million. I'm okay with that. Yeah. The problem it, is that we didn't expect that because we're signing a player who just won two, who just won back-to-back -back cups. And historically, those players don't really do well as free agents elsewhere, yeah. you know. Uh, but Goudreau has been great. You know, Goudreau has been really good. And, and he's played up and down the line. He's played on every single line, first line, second line, third line, fourth line. Uh, uh, he's good on a penalty kill too. He he brings something that's really difficult to replace. Yeah, three point six million might be a little bit rich, but if he plays the way he has been playing now for four out of his next five seasons, yeah, that contract's not going to be an issue at all. Yeah, I I I really didn't expect this much from him, and uh, pleasantly surprised and. I, I gotta tell you another guy, a really small sample size, and you might think I'm nuts, but I actually have liked what I've seen from Brzezinski. Oh, Brzezinski has been has been a surprise uh, because he's not really a he's not really an NHL player. He's never right. really had an extended look in the NHL, but when he's been given an opportunity, he's delivered and. Again, this is something that came up when I was talking to Matt Rampa yesterday. Um, you know, these guys are also important. When you go into the playoffs, everyone always focuses on first line, second line. The reason the Rangers made it to the Stanley Cup final in 2014 wasn't a first or second line. It was that third line of Puglia, Brassard, and Zuccarello, because that was a nightmare matchup for, for our opponents. Yep. Because either you go up against, what was it? It was uh, Richards, Haglin. Kreider, I think. Um, I, they they switched a little bit. They're, they're, I think Nash spent. I think it was Stepan Nash. I'm trying to remember now. Wait, Marty St. Louis was with Richards and. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So so it was Haglin, Richards, St. Louis, and yes. then Kreider, Stepan Nash. That's, yes. Those, those are your second, first and second line that your opponent has to match with. Has, has to match up with. And then all of a sudden, you come up with this third line of Puglia, Brassard, Zuccarello, who all three had had an amazing season. Uh, that's what got – and, oh, don't forget about the fourth line with Dorset, Boyle, and Moore. Great line. Yes. And the Rangers have something similar now too. You know, that fourth line I'm not worried about. The third line has been a little bit of a concern until the deadline. Yeah. But now, like you said, we have options. We can mix and match. We can shuffle it around a little bit. And you can put Cop on the third line. You can put Patrano on the third line. You can play around with it uh, and find the combination that works. That uh, 2014 team, uh, I've talked with a few people about it. They didn't really have, to me, they had three second lines. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could, you could, you could say that. Yeah, and that's, and they had great depth, and you know, uh, of course, Hank in net was was amazing, and. Um, yeah, it's a shame that team. I really thought the 2015 team, um, the following year, I really thought they were going to win it. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you know what Tampa's third line was the last two years when they won two cups? Yeah, it was um, Goudreau, Coleman, and Yanni Gord. Yes. So, Yanni Gord's doing pretty well in Seattle. You know, uh, 
Yanni Gord is, is signed for for 5.1 million a year. So, uh, and, but he has 43 points in 67 games. He missed a couple with injury. Decent. Yeah. Uh, Goudreau has 30 points for 3.6. Blake Coleman, who's with Calgary, is earning 4.9 million. And he only has 33 points. Goudreau is go. only three points behind Coleman. How many goals does Coleman have? Uh, let me check. 16. 16 goals, 17 assists. Yeah, that sounds about right for, for Blake Coleman. I remember uh, when he was with the Devils, uh, he always was like a pest. Um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, he could skate really well. Uh, I'm always on guys that can skate. And that's part yeah. of the reason why I like Brzezinski a little bit, because I see that he he, he can he can motor and, um, you know, he, he likes to shoot, per, uh, shoot first. Uh, yeah. No, but I Coleman, like guys Coleman. like that. Yeah, Coleman had back to back twenty goal twenty goal seasons in uh, in New Jersey. Yeah, they can have a first rounder for for Goudreau and for Coleman. Yes, Tampa. Yeah, and and Tampa's trying to do the same with Brandon Hagel now. You know, they gave up I think two firsts, a hey, first and a second for that a hasn't guy. Worked who, out so far. Well, he has three goals I think in what 14, 15 games. Uh, yeah. He started a bit slow, but you're you're paying for a guy. Who's on the books for 1.5 million for the next two years that's for true. a team like Tampa? That's a that's a massive deal. Yeah, you know yeah. that's that's a that's a great bargain. And is Tampa really going to be that upset about giving up first round picks when they develop players better than anyone else? Look at Sirelli, Point, Kucherov, Palat, Kilorn, uh, Johnson, yeah. Gore, who we mentioned. Yeah. Uh, 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 you could even say the the kids they traded at the deadline they de- they developed those guys. Yeah, uh, Joseph and Radish, Radish. And, yeah, and uh, Kachuk, uh, you know. Yeah, Boris Kachuk, who went to Chicago as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't, they, I don't think, I don't think Tampa's worried about losing a first round pick because, and this is the other thing, um, you know, it's a lot easier to sell to your fan base as you're giving up your first round picks when you already have two cups in your back pocket. Everything at this point now is gravy. Exactly. The the Blackhawks in 2015, same thing. They gave up a first round pick for Antoine Vermet. Yes. Just basically for face offs. <laughs> yeah. Third line center, <laughs> give up a first round pick. But no. you can easily sell it to your fans because you go, listen, we won two cups in the last couple of seasons. We're going to try it for a third. And they got it. But even if they didn't get it, what do you have to lose? You already won two cups. Yeah. Um, but, and I think that's probably one of the one of the most beneficial like mutually beneficial trades ever in the nhl the, the coyotes got a first round pick out of it vermette got a cup out of it so did so did the blackhawks and then vermette went back to arizona and signed yeah. for the exact same cap hit yeah. as his previous contract it was that was all that was that was like such such a harmonious situation <laughs> po- poetic almost but the rangers need to yeah, the Rangers just need to get there first. And I think they have a good team. I think in – I always expected them to go for a cup in 2024. Um, when you look at teams like the Penguins, the Blackhawks, uh, the Bruins, and the Kings, uh, basically the four, four most successful templates to use in the salary cap era to build a team, it took them at least five years from their first top three, top five pick to winning a cup. The Rangers drafted Kako second overall only three years ago. It feels yeah. longer, but it's it been does. only three years. Um, so if you look at that, like the most the most optimistic uh, scenario would be, I think, the LA Kings. The LA Kings won a cup like five years. I think the Penguins, it took the Penguins seven. No, it took, sorry, it took the Penguins six. It took or seven and it took the Blackhawks six. But right. that's sort of the timeline you you should you should look at. And the Rangers, if they can go to, if they can win a round and get to the second round, that's already great. You know, for a team that hasn't made the playoffs in five years. Um get their playoff experience in now. Yeah. And something that that also isn't discussed enough, I think, is that a lot of these players haven't even played an 82 game season yet. Yeah. Fox, Lindgren, Miller, Kako, Lafreniere. This is their even Lindgren and Fox, who we acquired like in 20, uh, 2019. 
and Lindgren in 2018. Correct. They haven't played an 82 game season in the NHL yet because of the pandemic. Yep. Um, so this everything we're playing, anything we're playing now is already a new experience for them. All right. We touched on a whole bunch of things. One more thing before we, we wrap it up. What about, and this is sort of future stuff, but let's just talk about a couple guys, a couple prospects. How great uh, of a season did uh, Brennan Offman have? Oh, uh, look, there was a lot of shit talking about Offman last summer. Yep. You know, uh, people were criticizing his, uh, his lack of scoring and this and that and Razor people that are active on Twitter have have seen what I'm referring to. But look, the kid broke the franchise record, not just for goals, but also for points as a Flint Firebird. He scored 50 goals. He's only one of only two players in the OHL to score 50 goals this season. The only other player to score 50 this season is Luke Evangelista, who is a year older. He's 20. Okay. Uh, I think he's a Dallas Stars prospect. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Plays for the London Knights. Look, Brandon Othman has carried his team on his back. That's the other thing. He has 38 more points than the second highest scorer on his team. Wow. That's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, you look at other guys like, you know, why Johnston, who was a first round pick last summer, center plays for the Windsor Spitfires with yeah. Lil Cooley. You know, great player, had great production, hit 100 points, but he plays on a better team. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, that that's not to discredit his production or anything, but it puts it into context. Othman, especially the first two or three months, had no one. He was carrying that team on his back by himself. And the way he finished the regular season, that's that's like that, that's, that's, that's stuff you see in movies. You know, he goes into the last game of the season with 46 goals. And people go, oh, if he gets a hat trick, at least he gets close to 50, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then he just scores four goals and hits 50. It's ridiculous. It's funny. I I, I think I, I, I DM'd you and I was like, how can I watch this? And you gave me the attachment. And mm -hmm. I watched the third period. And um, it was great. I couldn't believe it actually happened. I was like. Holy crap! Like yeah. he got his 50th goal, and, and he he did the OB celebration with the yeah, with the yeah like the hot stick. Yeah, 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 it was great. Yeah. So, I uh, you know, definitely, um, um, he's got a, hopefully a bright future with the Rangers. Uh, you know, hopefully they don't push bring him along too fast. But can I we just speak real quick about um someone I really, really, really am looking forward to seeing? Can I guess? It, go ahead. Is it Brett Berard? It is. I love this kid. I was so happy mm -hmm. when they drafted him in 2020. I actually was out and I came back in and I had to draft on. I had left my TV on because I was only going to be out for a few minutes. And they mentioned Brett Berard. And a shout out to the draft analyst, Steve Cornianos, who I'm sure you know. I'm, I met him in 2019 in Vancouver at the draft. Yeah. Great guy. He, he talked him up so much. And I was like, oh, man, we got Berard. I was like, all right. This is great. And he's just been killing it. Uh, for Do you remember the World, the, the World Juniors? He was phenomenal. And he, that, that's going to segue into my second part of my question. Yeah. So give me give me the skinny on Berard. And then do you think he's playing in August at the World Juniors? Oh, in August at the World Juniors? 100%. Awesome. He, sh he should be the third or fourth name that they write down on their list on that okay. team. Good. Um, he's going to play in the World Juniors, no question about it. Great. Um, what to expect? I think he's going to be in college for another year. First of all, because I think he still has some development left sure. there. You know, it's not like he's completely dominating. Um, he's also still very young. You know, he turned he turned um, eighteen, I think, at the end of August. Okay. Early September. So in his draft class, he was among the younger players in his draft class. He's also um, a very slight kid. Like he's a small, yeah. he's a smallish guy, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the way it is. And I have no problem with drafting yeah. a smaller player. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want him to be able to get a little yeah. stronger too. And the other reason he wants to stay in college is because he wants to have an opportunity to play with his younger brother, Brady Berard. 
okay. who is draft eligible this upcoming summer and who is starting with Providence next next season. And their dad, I think, is the director of, of administration. So oh. it's like a family affair there. His, his dad right. used to be a goalie for the Providence Friars. I think his mom played field hockey okay uh, or for them so providence college is like is like a, a huge part of the barard family tradition uh i'm okay with him staying in college for another year i mean the kids like the kids only 20 he's only turning 20 in august yeah still- you know um if you can if you, listen he's definitely not nhl ready so there's no point of rushing the guy i uh, mm-hmm. let him have the fun play with his brother you know it's funny uh my best friend growing up and his younger brother both went to Providence college. And I remember going up there a couple times visiting and there was a Ranger draft pick that played on Providence, Rick Bennett. This okay. is like, this is like 1991, maybe mm-hmm. it's going back many, many years, but, but anyway, um, yeah, love me some Berard, uh, really excited for him. The energy, um, who was the, the other the guy? player he compares himself to is Brendan Gallagher. I mean, who wouldn't want to have a guy like that on your in team? In the fifth round? Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll take it. Definitely. All right. Um, another guy real quick. How about um, we'll talk about uh, Will Cooley. Yeah, Cooley has surprised a lot of people with the way he's played this season. Um I think that stint in Hartford last season when the OHL was still uh, was still canceled definitely helped him. Um, you know, just practicing with pro hockey players, it, 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 it helps you develop. Um, and a lot of kids already do this, you know. Uh, talking to these prospects, it's amazing the connections you find out about. Um, for instance, Ryder Korzak, who plays in the WHL for Moose Jaw, he works out with Jordan Eberle because I think his dad used to coach Jordan Eberle. Hmm. So there's connections there. And, uh, you know, Robertson uh, uh, Robertson and, and Schneider, of course, knew each other before they were drafted by the Rangers. Talon Boyko and Metarempe have known each other ever since they were like, I think, 15, 14, 15 years old. Hold on, let me quickly plug in my uh, my charger from my laptop. No worries. Um, where is it? Where is it? Oh, there you go. Yeah, I forgot to plug in my uh, my charger before you started recording. That's okay. There we go. Um, but yeah, Will Cooley um, really impressed me, especially especially with the way he plays. You know, he's captain of the Windsor Spitfires, but also brought a scoring touch to his game this season. I think he finished with 46 goals in the OHL. Wow, that's like a lot in of the goals. 40s, in the 40s. Um, really looking forward to see what he's going to do in Hartford next season. Um, I think in the NHL, he's probably going to be like, in, uh, like a bottom six player. Uh, Agreed. But... And again, you know, you need to develop those players yourself. You don't want to overpay for those in free agency. So having a guy like Will Cooley coming through the ranks, that's great. Um, So, yeah, we'll see what happens next season. But what I find fascinating is that for years we were talking about defensemen. You know, we were talking about Lundqvist and Miller and Jones and Robertson and Schneider and Hunter Skinner and Simon Schelberg. And it was all defensemen. Uh, only thing we talked about with prospects was defensemen, Lindgren right. and Fox. Now all those defensemen are on the contract, and now the next sort of generation of Ranger prospects, like the top guys, are all forwards. That's exactly what we need. You know, you have Berard who plays left wing, right wing. Same with Othman. Uh, Cooley is a left winger. Korzak is a center. Uh, Matt Rempe, who is under contract with the Rangers already, he's going to start in Hartford next season. He's a he's a center who doesn't mind playing wing. Um, he's a big body. I think he's six eight, and you know he's he's huge. Um, <laughs> and and Rempe is an interesting case because he reminds me a lot of Ryan Reeves, not so much stylistically, but more in in the in the in the way that I feel that his style of hockey and the way he plays is better suited for pro level 
than it mm. is for juniors. Okay. Because in juniors, he always has to sort of hold back a little bit because he overpowers every opponent that, that he faces on the ice. He, he goes up against 16, 17, 18-year-old kids. And even though he's only 19, you know, the guy's 6'8", like wow, 220 pounds. He ragdolls players into the boards without even trying. And yeah. then, you know, when he got to 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 uh, camp last summer with the Rangers, he was so excited to actually, you know, play against players that could that could, you know, that that could match his intensity and his physicality. Yeah. You know, going up against Reeves and Truba and and yeah, men. I think I think Rempin might surprise people. That's good news. All right, well, listen, pal, I got to wrap it up because I got to run out and grab uh, meet up uh, with my kids here. Okay. But I want to appreciate the time. This is great, man. Like, I can't tell you how much fun this was. Um, this was great. Uh, we, should, we should do it again sometime, man. Huh? Absolutely. Um, it would be nice to do something maybe during the playoffs. If, 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 if somehow the Rangers can win a round mm-hmm. and maybe have a couple days off and we all can take a breath, Oh yeah, the key to winning a cup. There, there's two things that are key to winning a cup: not getting injured and yeah. winning series in fewer than seven games. Yeah. Listen, I tease my kids all the time, and I tell them about 1994. I, I, I tell them I didn't breathe for two months. I literally I felt like I was holding my breath for two months, and that probably took. You, 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 you breathed through the first two rounds in only nine games. I I know, but that, that helps you so much because no, it did. The last right. two series though were so I mean it was, right. oh god. That devil series was the, just... the final against the Canucks should never have gone more than five games. No. Yeah, I agree. I mean honestly, we should have won the first game. I think we had like fifty something shots on goal, lost in overtime. And then we won the next three, and then game five we wound up losing. Yeah. And then, and then you go back to Vancouver for game six. I knew we were coming back to the garden for game seven. There was no way we were winning on the road that game. Yeah. So. But the real Stanley Cup final that year was against the Devils. Okay. So, like, I, I will say that in my lifetime, that's the greatest series I've ever witnessed. It, it, it just was – it was unreal hockey. I mm-hmm. mean, it was – you look at if you look at the lineups of those teams – how many Hall of Fame players are, are involved in that series? Yeah, it's yeah. The range, I think the Rangers had six. I mean, let's just really quick uh, go. Th- you had um, Messier, Anderson. Is Anderson a Hall of Famer? Yes. Uh, you had Brian Leach. Yeah, Zuboff. Zuboff. Um, Wait. No, the sorry, the, the other one. Uh, no, he, he. Who's the other one though? That's in the Hall of Fame. Who's Kevin Lowe. Kevin Lowe. Kevin Lowe. Kevin Lowe. Lowe, So that's five. And then the Devils at least had Brodor, Scott Stevens, Scott Niedermeyer. Fetisov. Fetisov. So that's four, at least four on their side. Yeah. So that's nine Hall of Famers in the series. That's. I mean, it was just. And you had really good players. I mean, like Esatik and Claude Lemieux and Billy Garrett. Was in mm-hmm. that series, and and you know Kovalev. Uh, Kovalev. I mean, Kovalev had a thousand points in the league. I know he's not an all of fame, but he, yeah. Um, I, I will go down. Okay, real quick. And I know uh, we said we would stop, but two things. Um, Kovalev was a top ten all time talent. I feel like he has just top ten skills amongst anybody that's ever played. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I. I he could have gotten 1500 points if he really, really, really focused on his game. I don't know, but um, the passing of Mike Bossy, uh, I, I went back and I was looking at his numbers. Man alive, that dude, and I know he's probably a little bit before your time, uh, Steven. Uh, I was born in 84, so yeah, yeah, he retired in 86 or 87, I think. I think that was his last year, it was 86, 87. Bossy had 573 goals in 762 games. <clears throat> I mean, and he had like 1,100 and something points. So the man, the man put up points. He was just, yeah. 
I think he holds the record for most 50 goal seasons in a row. Yeah, possible. Yeah. And he, uh, and he had 60 goals like five times in a row. I mean, it was just, he was unbelievable. Uh, it, it's sad. Oh, um, who's the better goal scorer, Ovechkin or Bossy? Well, I actually, um, you know, everybody's going to say Ovechkin. I mean, the guy's a machine. I mean, he is. Um, if Ovechkin didn't have two lockouts and two shortened COVID seasons, he'd be like 20 goals away from Gretzky right yeah, now. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I Listen, Ovi's great. I, I'm yeah. not going to sit here and say he's not great because he's unbelievable. But he's also um, been in the league for 17 years, and Bossy was in the league for what? Bossy only played 10 seasons, and he only yeah. played 762 games. And he had his goals per game is higher, it's the highest ever. Yeah. And, but I will go down and say that, in my opinion, the, the best score I've ever seen, score, not player, score, was Lemieux. He had 690 goals in 915 games. So, I don't know. That, that dude was unstoppable. I mean, and everybody's like, oh, well, the goaltending stunk back then. And I get it. It wasn't. Yeah, it this wasn't. is the same argument people use against Gretzky. Like, oh, the only reason Gretzky put up 200 points because goaltending was shit in the 80s. But then no one um, else was doing it. No one else was doing it. I mean, he's the only one who, I think he's the only one who hit 200. And he hit it like, what, three times? He did um, it three times. Mario got to 199. Yes. He got close. But he did. Other, and Mario was. Argument, the other Not argument you always hear is, uh, oh, only reason Gretzky got so many points is because he played on the best team in the league. But he outscored everyone on his team by 100 points. Yeah, guys they, were getting 110 points. He was getting 190. Yeah. In, in the 1980s, I think there are seven or eight seasons where per season, Gretzky outscored the second highest scorer in the league by at least 65 points. Yeah. I mean, he was just on a different level. My favorite, Gretzky, my favorite Gretzky stat is this one, though. Wayne Gretzky is the fastest player to 1,000 1, points in the league. I know you're going with this. And he's also the second fastest when he did it a second time. Yes. That's yeah. how absurdly good he was. And yeah. I, he had the most dominant career in North American sports. I agree. I mean, he was so much better than anybody else that was playing. Yeah. And I was, again, that was right in my young, I was 10 in 1982. So he started in 79, 80. And I just remember I used to get up every morning and watch the highlights because couldn't watch Edmonton Oilers games mm -hmm. back then. Um, and this is what Wayne did. This is what Gretzky did. And I remember vividly watching the TV, being on vacation from school that morning after he scored his 50th goal in 39 games. And my dad and I were just like, this guy's un unbelievable. Like, what's he gonna do next? You yeah. know. So, but they they have yeah ninety two and eighty two. He had well, they only played eighty games back. Oh, so yeah, in eighty one, eighty two, he had ninety two goals in eighty games. Eighty games, eighty games, ninety two goals, ninety two goals, and he had fifty in thirty nine go in games. Fifty mm -hmm. goals. He was something else. But all right, pal, listen. Uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you on Twitter. And uh, I really appreciate this. I'll let you know uh, when I when I publish all this, and I'll sure. send you it. Like, I appreciate all it, pal. Right. All right. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Bye.